uh, point here is really why do most of the New York Academy of Sciences uh, have decided to look at the issue of the retention of STEM teachers? Uh, I think everyone here knows there's no denial of the, the fact that we have an, a crisis in STEM education. Uh, there's a mismatch, a disconnect between the skills that students have, the skills they need, the skills that teachers have, the number of teachers we have, the skills that workers have, and what we need. There's no denial of the disconnect, and unfortunately in the last several years there's been more effort, more resources, more ideas devoted to getting more teachers in the classroom. And that's a great thing. But an outstanding and important question is, what happens once they're there? How do we keep them teaching? And that's the question that Demos is interested, the Academy of Sciences is interested, and I think everybody here is interested in. Um, because unless we can sort of plug that hole and, and keep the good people that we're bringing into the classrooms, um, then all these efforts really sort of uh, come to naught. Uh, the conversation that we want to have, uh, both in this panel and in uh, work that we're doing, papers we'll be doing, other things we'll be doing in the future, is really how do we, and I mean me, my, myself, everybody here in this room, organizations and institutions that we represent, how do we retain STEM teachers? Now, when you talk to people, teachers about why they're leaving, when you look at the research, the reasons why people leave aren't always incredibly complicated, insurmountable, impossible political challenges. There's a lot of very simple things we can do. And they revolve around supporting teachers, making them feel like they're getting professional development, teaching them, or te treating them as professionals. And it's a conversation around those types of things, things that, that are doable, that are possible, that we want to create. I want to thank you all for coming here tonight and being part of that conversation. Thanks, and I, I feel like we're really lucky to have a partner with Demos and also a partner with Jennifer, so I want to thank her. And I also would like to thank our steering committee. A number of um, members are here tonight, and I just want to say thank you. They've been instrumental in, um, in doing this work in helping us find resources and also providing their own stories for the white papers that we've been working on. When Jennifer and I set out to start to do some work in public policy, uh, we wanted to find some areas that we felt there were solutions that a lot of different people could get behind and really we could find areas that different stakeholders could find things that they could do and actually activate these policy recommendations. But we also wanted to find a couple of areas of interest that weren't highly politicized already, that there weren't two camps that were screaming at each other, throwing research bombs at each other back and forth. And we felt like teacher retention fit really nicely um, within this particular uh, framework that we had set up. But on a very personal note, when I was teaching, I also found myself in love with teaching, um, but also completely disgusted by the education system that I was working with. We didn't have toilet paper. Um, we didn't have any sort of sense of safety or security for the kids. Um, and at a large amount of the time, we actually didn't even have heat in the building. And I found myself so frustrated with the disrespect from the administration within the building that I said, forget this. No matter how much I love teaching, I'm going to find another way to use my skills um, in education to make a difference. And so for me personally, this, this is a topic where um, I felt like I wanted to try to match up my own personal anecdotal evidence and the anecdotal evidence of my friends with the research and then actually find some actionable um, recommendations that we could put forth to teachers, to school leaders, to districts, um, and to researchers who are working in the field who really want to try to make a difference. Um, so without further ado, I just want to introduce our moderator. Um, Julia, Dr. Julia Rankin has extensive experience in K-20 education with students of all ability levels. She is the former K-12 Director of Science for the New York De City Department of Education and the Director of Science Life Skills K-12 for the Bridgeport Public Schools in Connecticut. Committed to urban education, she helped develop, develop NSTA's Urban Science Education Leaders. As CEO and President of the Science Collaborative, Inc., she works to build and enhance professional learning communities. For the last three years, she's coordinated the California Science Teacher Retention Initiative and the Science and Math Initiative for Los Angeles Education Partnership. Presently, she is the Project Manager for the Friends of the Los Angeles River, developing the FOLAR, is that how you yeah, <laughs> that right, Developing the <laughs> Folar River Rover, a mobile education interpretive cent uh, center. So without further ado, our moderator, Julia Rankin. Thank you. Thank you. 
It's great to be back here in New York City. I love being here. I'm a West Coaster now, but I love New York. I had this amazing, amazing group of, of comrades completely dedicated to science education that you just do not find spread out all over California. And right here, you're all together. You can meet regularly. And the New York Academy of Science provides an amazing opportunity for you all to get together. So it's just a thrill to be here. Um, today, we're going to talk about teacher retention. And it's something that we're all very concerned about, and we definitely want it to help teachers stay in the profession. And we have some great panelists today, and we'll share some research, and we'll share some of their thoughts and ideas, and really try to get a handle on what we as a group, being the, the Academy of Science, and teachers and colleges, universities, informal institutions, how do we work together to really support teachers and make them feel valued and make them want to stay in the system, which is what we definitely want. The, um, Sheila Tobias was here back in 2010. Some of you, were any of you here for that with 2010 with Sheila? Great, a few of you were here. Talking about her new book, which was Science Teaching as a Profession. And it's a great book if you can get a hold of that. Uh, wonderful and very new. Talking about the role of teachers and are we really professionals or aren't we professionals? How are we treated? And she cited that the loss of autonomy, control, and stature were the most important things to teachers. It, that money was, was, is an issue for everyone. We all would like more money. But that was not a key factor. And that retention is, as she, she just emailed me a few days ago, is the issue that she believes. And this is from her work. So we're very pleased to have this as a follow-up from her work and as a continuation of the conversation about teacher retention. The, my work in California was in the last three years, one of the, the roles that I had was coordinating a, a very interesting teacher retention grant and it involved, it was the California Science Project, which is 18 different institutions, UCLA, UC Irvine, you know, major institutions are part of that, and nine of those institutions had this teacher retention program. And the teacher retention program was scientists working with the teachers, middle school and high school, to see what we could do, what we could put in place to really help the teachers feel part of this larger learning community. So it's the professional learning communities we were establishing and doing all sorts of professional development. Nine different sites, very different, very different. Some were urban, some were rural, some were school-based, some were community or regionally based, so a wide variety of different types of PLCs. And from those, we came up with three, three very good predictors of retention. And um, one is the perceived confidence in the effectiveness of teachers, and, and I have more research on that we can share with you. The research, some of it was done by um, Center for Teacher Quality, and I can send you a copy of that report if you'd like. But the perceived confidence and effectiveness of teachers, so if you feel good about your ability to reach students, that you have a good understanding of your content area, that you can bring students into project-based work, that you really understand how to teach science and are comfortable with the content, that that is a, a definite predictor of retention. Identifying with a PLC where you feel that you're really part of this working community, that's another predictor. And then the relevance of the professional development. One of the things that we, we were hoping to see but were surprised to see it go so effectively was the way it changed, the way the, the scientists changed the way they taught these teachers. They've been working with teachers for years. Uh, over 20 years, this, these programs have been in place. But this particular one asked them to form a professional learning community. And in this, what they had to do was change the way they taught the way they taught the teachers. And so what happened is we ended up developing these collaborative leadership um, ended up happening at each site. And it was just amazing to watch. So that the teachers now were in control of their own professional development. The PD to them was relevant. It wasn't, okay, we're all going now. It's 3.30 in the afternoon and we're going to do X. It was, come to our school, let's go here, field experiences, whatever it was. So that was a very important piece. And you had to be very flexible, very flexible in terms of your programming to really reach the teachers. So it's a good message for all of us who are in the profession of teaching teachers. Very helpful. And the other big excitement was the new and experienced teachers. The program was originally designed to, to really help teachers around four or five years in that were, was our biggest area of losing teachers. And instead, we ended up with a lot of experienced teachers and new teachers working together. They loved working together. We saw as much gains in teacher confidence and comfort and happiness in being a teacher. Um, their desire to stay based on, on that love of just working together and sharing their craft. So it's you know some really nice research that's come out of that. 
Uh, of course, it was confounded by the fact that it was at the same time with economic stress and people were getting pink slipped everywhere and losing jobs. So it is a very stressful time right now for teachers across the board. Uh, some of you might have read today the MetLife survey uh, just came out on teachers. And it is depressing. It's only 44% of teachers are very satisfied. And that might not sound too bad, but it's the lowest since 1989. That's pretty low uh, in terms of teachers feeling very satisfied about their, their role and their jobs. 29% uh, saying that they're going to probably leave within five years. It was 17% saying that in 2009. Uh, economics are tough. Some people are, you know, people are struggling everywhere. And teachers are being particularly hard hit with all sorts of issues. And so our role here today is to say, how can we together as professionals come up with solutions? So we have this really wonderful um, group today. And I will introduce them, and they will tell a little bit about themselves. And first, I'll introduce David Steiner. You probably know most of these people on the, the panel. But David Steiner um, is someone you know probably very well. Hunter College School of Education right now. He's the dean. And he's had tremendous jobs in administration and all sorts of education. So he'll tell you a little about, about his work. David. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, some of you know I spent a little bit of time in Albany. And we were faced with many of the issues that we're raising tonight. Uh, also had the, the privilege of leading some summer institutes for high school teachers in Massachusetts for many years, working uh, particularly with those studying literature. Um, and we at Hunter have tried to learn from teacher communities about how to prepare teachers more effectively. We have 3,000 students uh, right now at Hunter learning to be teachers. We put about 1,000 a year into the New York City public schools. Um, so this is clearly a, a huge issue for us. Uh, we, we want the best of them to stay and to, to learn how to do that better. Uh, there are no educational issues, perhaps sadly, perhaps not, that are not political. Uh, as we will discover this evening, I'm sure. Uh, and these issues tend to be contentious, but deeply interesting and vitally important. So looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. And Preeti Gupta, uh, probably, I think most people know Preeti as well. Great. She's been in the city for a long time, I think forever. Are you from the city? I am. <laughs> from the city. <laughs> Doing great work. And she's now the Director of Youth Learning and Research at the American Museum of Natural History. So Preeti. Thank you, um, Julia. So. I have been um, working, doing professional development work with teachers for about 15 years, um, and prior to being at the Museum of, prior to being um, at the museum, I was at the New York Hall of Science, where I had just completed a five-year project funded by NSF called Cluster, and it was a, a pilot project, a research project um, about teacher preparation, um, and. It, it became the foundation for a lot more um, work that I've done since then. Um, and it, it also sort of um, brings together the role that cultural institutions like the Hall of Science, like American Museum of Natural History, can play in supporting teacher preparation and, um, and then teachers in the induction process and then the overall teacher retention. So I'll be happy to talk more about what I've learned and what I've, um, the actual kind of activities we did to support. Great, thank you. And Michael Holmes is here. He's a science teacher, so we wanted a practitioner here, science uh -huh. teacher at the High School for American Studies at Lehman College. Michael? So uh, <clears throat> I didn't start out as a teacher, so it's interesting for me now to be here. I actually started out as a research biologist. I worked with the Population Council and Albert Einstein. That's actually how I ended up in New York City. And I think my role today is kind of give you anecdotal um, bits of evidence. And also, as someone who's done a lot within teaching in the nine years, I've worked in the Museum of Natural History, developing some of their curriculum that they have online. I've worked with PBS, developing some of their curriculum that they have online. I've also done several programs throughout the city. And I definitely want to talk about that and how that encourages teachers to stay in the profession. So. Great, great. So you see it's a, a varied uh, group, which is wonderful. A lot of great experience here. So we're going to start off. The way we're going to do this is we'll have a series of questions that we will um, we'll be asking them to respond to. And then we will open for questions for about 15, 20 minutes to give you a chance for questions or comments. And we really, our whole focus today is the positive things that we can do to help retain teachers. Okay. So um, we'll start off with our first question. Uh, what challenges does the current political climate create 
regarding motivated teachers um, to enter and stay in the profession, and what effect does uh, evaluation, sharing student test scores, measures like that, how is that affecting teachers as well? David, do you want to start with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the MET survey you cited earlier has another fact, which is that since two, comparing 2009 and 2011, the number or the percentage of teachers who are worried about their job security has gone up from 9% to 34%. That's a stunning rise. Uh, if you are very anxious about your job, uh, you're looking over your shoulder and you're wondering what's coming next. Uh, it's not the most hospitable context. Uh, the, obviously, the major policy initiative that is behind that is not simply the, it's not simply the economy, though that's important. It is the imposition across the country, partly motivated by Race to the Top and other policies from the federal government of teacher evaluation. Um, I would say, having been one of the commissioners that, that obviously helped put this in place, it's, it's at best a double-edged sword. The, the data on teachers actually shows that in the last few years, the quality of students going into teaching has gone up um, considerably. It's now at the high school level, well above the national uh, SAT average, for example. But policymakers tend to look at bell curves, uh, let's be honest, and they, they tend to look at where the professions are. Uh, and of course, it takes a long time for new teachers to become the norm of all teachers. And to be very frank, uh, the evaluation systems were built for a labor pool that was regarded as weak. Um, so you built a system for a, a labor pool that w it was thought, and it remains the, the policy, I think, needs to have sort of a fire put underneath it um, and needs to be held strictly accountable and needs to be, in a sense, frightened. Now, there's a lot of rhetoric about also encouraging and the professional development and recognizing great teaching. And that's not just rhetoric um, in all of the states. And I think in New York, we will do much more to recognize great teaching, at least I hope so. But I think we need to be frank with each other that the evaluation system was built out of fear of low performance. And that does have a very major effect on not only the existing labor pool, but those who are prospective teachers, right? I mean, would you go into a field where you are the only professionals with master's degrees that are held to this kind of very sort of, sort of very granular, if you will, level of accountability? And the answer for many people is going to be no. Uh, I mean, it's not that attractive for many, unless you can think of it as a pretty low bar and as a great teacher, you're going to soar above it, uh, sort of the Yale law, degree, Yale law student view of the bar exam, right? You're just, it's, it's not going to be relevant because you're a great teacher and it's just not going to be an issue. But I think, sorry to go on so long, but it's an important question. I think bottom line, um, we built an evaluation system out of a particular context for a particular labor pool um, and that will have multiple uh, both intended and unintended consequences, some of which will be negative. And I think we just have to be honest about that. Kind of follow up on what Dan was saying. Some of those consequences might lead to things like teachers not feeling as if they have autonomy or the ability to be creative in the class when you know that the evaluation system is kind of already skewed against you. And what's frightening is that when you're in the classroom, and you're in the mode of teaching and you're thinking about how, what's best for your students, your mind might wander back to, well, I know if I don't get a certain score at the end of your testing, I'm not going to be rated as a, a good teacher or an effective teacher. So you may even stifle those things that you think are best for your students in hopes of achieving what race to the top wants you to be or what a no child left behind, which I guess is being phased out right now, wants you to be. And to me, that takes away a lot of what keeps teachers there because one of the things you mentioned earlier, Julia, was the idea of autonomy and the idea of being self-directed. And when that's taken away from you as a teacher, then you almost think, well, what's the point? I might as well put a robot here to do what I'm doing because otherwise, you know, none of my personality, none of the things that I can do that I'm great at can shine. So some major ramifications. Did you want to respond to that? 
I just one quick follow up. Obviously, one of the key questions is the movement of assessment design, right? So if you have bad tests, then it's particularly gruesome to be evaluated against bad tests because yes. um, they're not worth teaching to. Yeah, right. uh, the, there are two consortiums right now, each with $180 million in federal funding, one called Park, one called Smarter Balance. They are charged with creating next generation assessments that do deep probing, that look for understanding, that look for uh, long responses. Theoretically, I, I underline theoretically, uh, five years from now, actually less, it's supposed to be in place in 2014, so a lot, much less, but that's optimistic. Uh, s we are supposed to have much better assessments that will be the groundwork for the part of the teacher evaluation that is test-based. And hopefully with the assessment, with the new assessments, with the you know, really looking at teaching and with the learning differently, right. it will change some of the skills that we want for teachers. That's, so, the, that's right. Right. So that leads me to my next question of what skills do teachers need to be successful and what kinds of programs um, will help prepare and motivate the teachers? Pretty? I think um, there's a number of things that, that may not seem surprising when I say it, but are, but are actually um, ways that we can help teachers that we don't actually put into practice often enough. Um, and for example, um, when we support teachers and become it, when we support people in becoming a teacher, what are the different opportunities that they have to work with children before they enter a classroom? And the, of course, there's a lot more effort on the part of policy, on the part of universities, and partnerships between schools and universities, and museums and schools and universities. Um, in fact, the state, Race to the Top Money, um, has supported for the first time, a pilot, a pilot project funding a number of sites in New York to do clinically rich um, teacher residency programs. I mean, it's, it, you, you could only win that money if you had in it um, a huge residency component where teachers were in the schools during their preparation period and theory and practice was linked together. So the Museum of Natural History has um, one of those grants and it's the only one that's actually solely out of a uh, museum. Um, so it's truly a very, um, it's innovative in that and it's a pilot project and, and the, the opportunity we have with a project like this and with projects like the ones that I ran um, at the Hall of Science is putting people in, in front of children, different children, same children. So what do I mean by that? I mean, in a museum setting, for example, you can ask a person to teach a lesson, maybe on the museum floor, um, for 10 minutes, and in, that, in, the, in like over three or four hours, they, that person has taught multiple people um, that lesson. And each time, you can imagine, they're getting a little bit better at it. And if you couple that with mentorship and with video reflection and with a, a variety of other supports, you can imagine that 100 hours later, this person understands what it means to teach these ideas to all kinds of learners. So that's just one of many things. Um, and I think... Um, another important piece of programs like this is teaching at the elbow of another, right? This is a phrase that I pick up from um, Dr. Ken Tobin at the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, it's well known sort of internationally as a term, but he's probably one of the first to bring it to our attention. So teaching at the elbow of another, literally teaching at the elbow of another, means co-teaching both in your preparation work but then possibly in your induction time and, and maybe even in, um, when you're in school, science teachers and e ELL teachers working together. I know there are so many schools, especially in the Bronx, where this kind of partnership is happening within the school and the teachers report that they are, by co-teaching with each other, they are so much more effective in getting across the science content to diverse audiences that they could never have done on their own in either case. But, but so it's teaching at the elbow of another, both when you're learning to teach with, you know, so two students learning to teach, a mentor teacher and a, and a, and a um, teacher candidate, um, a scientist and a teacher candidate. I mean, you can think about the different pairings and you can think about um, what it means, the benefits of how you become aware of what it means to effectively teach and learn for all parties, not just the teacher candidate, but all parties involved. 
Um, and I think you're going to talk to us a little bit about what it, you know, you, I, no, Julia, you brought it up, and I think you're going to talk about it, about how the scientists saw themselves teaching differently as they were sort of in these yes. learning yeah, communities. Another very important point we have, when we had the conversations with Preeti and with Michael is that they're both scientists. They've come from a science background. I, I had a science background. had no intention of teaching. Um, programs like Teaching Fellows got Michael into teaching. The program Preeti is doing is focused on people who are earth science majors uh, or working in the field of earth science. Not, again, the traditional role that we would get a teacher from, you know, regular teachers, kind of teacher college, as you said, so to speak, and then go into teaching, but actually bring in practitioners. And so that's one thing we might want to think about is, you know, do we almost want to, how do we encourage scientists, people who want to be in science, that want to do science, to get into teaching, um, science teaching. And when they get into teaching, one of the things that we've had conversations about, and I know with many of you the same, is that when they go to teach, especially at the secondary level, they feel, if they have the science background, that they're no longer science scientists. I know a science teacher. I can't do science anymore. I have to do tests, drill and kill. I have to do whatever, but I can't do science. So that's one of the things we want to keep thinking about is how do we get good science in there so they feel comfortable and that they can still do science, a good role for the academy. Michael, do you want to talk on to that? Sure. Um it's interesting because, again, like I said, I started out as a research biologist, and honestly, I had no intention of teaching. I remember when I moved here, and it was in the back of my mind, I had this grandiose idea that I would win a Nobel by the time I was 45, to do a lecture circuit and go teach. And then, yeah, it's pretty funny. I, yeah, I know now that I look back, it's hilarious. But as I was working in the lab, and I realized more and more I enjoyed the part where I was working with graduate students and helping them shape their projects, I got more and more the teaching bug. And then I decided to go and do, do volunteer work in teaching and working with kids with rudimental skills. And then I saw the teaching fellows poster on the subway. You've probably all seen them as you take the train. Um, I was like, wow, this looks pretty interesting. And I was looking for something different. And then when I went into the classroom, my first thought was, wow, I'm not a scientist anymore. Right. Right. I'm a teacher. And as I thought about that, it was, it was earth-shaking. Um, it really rattled my personality and the way I saw myself and the way I self-identified. But then I, as I got into the whole thing of teaching, I realized more and more that it's very similar to research in ways where you de, you know, depackaging content and you're trying to get kids to understand it, so you're always trying these experiments of what will work best for them understanding certain concepts. And as I got better as a teacher, I realized that, wow, the science background actually allows me to do things with projects and inquiry-based learning that just having a kind of a, not a rote memorization of chemistry or bio, but an understanding of bio and chemistry on a level of application, that I can take the students now and form, help them formulate questions and hypotheses and not treat the scientific method as just something you do the first at the beginning of the year, but actually take it as something that you develop over a period of a year or years with the students and really get them to see that science is a dynamic uh, organism. So how do we support teachers with that? And that's one of well, the things we're looking at in terms of our training programs. And should we change the training programs uh, more like the one that Preeti's doing? Yes. What is the role for uh, the, or the traditional science programs? That's what that I was going to bring. That's a, excellent. Right. In fact, as, my, as I was walking over with my friend Nick, who also teaches science at Banana Kelly, we were talking about a residency program where you take teachers for the, maybe that year, that last year of their undergraduate experience and put them with a teacher because you accomplish two things. You alleviate a lot of fears that new teachers have when they come in because I know I was scared to death. Like, what am I going to say to a room full of 15-year-olds? I mean, they're going to eat me alive. I have nothing to offer. So you kind of bring that anxiety level down. And also you give someone who's been in teaching for a while an experience where they actually are depackaging what they do and watch what someone else does and really give them a sense of mentorship that allows them to think that I am relevant and that even though these assessments that Race to the Top were putting in place and evaluations are trying to tell me I'm not relevant, I am quite relevant. And I find too that with that program you can also talk about teaching in a way that sometimes you can't because you're the only person in the classroom, you're the only one who saw that kid not really get what you were talking about. But if there are a multitude of people in that room, you can actually at the end of the day round and say, well look, this is what happened. Let's diagnose what took place here. Tomorrow we're going to try this. And if that doesn't work, okay, maybe something else can happen the following day, but at least you're dialogue, and at least you feel like you're in a collaborative effort. And those kind of skills are hard to come by when you're a new teacher and no one's there. 
David, would you like to? Sure. We, we run at Hunter one of the only two residency programs in New York, and there are only four or five in the country. The, the reason, and I, it seems to be my ungrateful role tonight to continually bring political reality back into the picture, mm -hmm. but the reason is it's in New York it's about $60,000 a student to do a proper residency program mm -hmm. um, because you're providing a stipend. And that's, that's unsustainable at scale. So we are thinking very hard, even though we love our residency program, we're trying to grow it, including with the Hall of Science. And uh, I'm delighted that, uh, congratulations on winning our, our race to the top thing for, for teacher prep, that it's, it's really a, a a national issue. We know the best way to prepare teachers would be through residencies and rich clinical experience. We prepare far too many candidates uh, to have an economically viable model for residency. In Finland, which is often cited as the world's best, one of the reasons they can give you such a st stunningly good teacher prep program is because they only take the numbers they need. Uh, we had in New York last year you know, 10 to 1 certified early childhood and childhood teachers compared to the jobs available. So we had over-prepared massively. Um, the, the challenge is, is to create a very different model of teacher preparation where we take really strong candidates, give them world best, deep clinical, in school, master teacher mentorships with trained mentors, um, and then put them into the schools. Um, that is not what we're doing today. Yes, absolutely. Please. You know, we're here to find solutions, right? So here's, you brought up the $60,000 mm -hmm. figure, which is reality. And it's the problem, right? It's too expensive. It's not sustainable. So here's a potential solution. There are, in the United States, approximately 350 science centers and probably twice as many natural history museums, botanical gardens, zoos, and other science-rich cultural institutions, right? Almost all of them have some sort of program where they use some type of volunteer or paid staff to do a few different things. They have them out on the exhibits and galleries or the gardens doing interpretive work. They have cart-based experiences. And then so many of them, more, almost, I would say more than 50% without actually having a report to cite, are in the business of after-school programming these days. And who teaches in those after-school programs, right? It's the museum staff or part-time staff that the museum hires who are teachers. So for example, the Museum of Natural History has an amazing after-school program for K through 12, and science teachers are the ones who teach this as a second job, or, or graduate students in some cases, but often they're mostly teachers. So what if the residency program, now I'm not trying to say that being in schools can be replaced by, by being in museums. I'm not saying that at all. I think you need to be in schools to experience the reality. But sort of moving in that step at least, what if there was a partnership with every university that was preparing teachers to a science-rich cultural institution that was in their neighborhood? And whatever number of students that were in you know, their senior year of their program, which is whatever, you tell me, 100 kids? I mean, sorry, not kids. 100 people. Well, we have 1,000. Uh, yes. I mean, you know, whatever it is, especially for Hunter, you're surrounded, for example, by so many uh, institutions. If you placed a few in each of these institutions, and yeah, it would look a little bit different, but in the end, the experience would mirror each other. And, you, we, and there were maybe some shared assessments and outcomes and evaluations that we could look for. We could be creating so many opportunities for, t for candidates to have that experience of teaching at the elbow of another, of working with diverse learners and, um, and diversifying their abilities to teach science content of integrating science, technology, engineering, and math, of um, doing materials management, which is really, really hard, right? For those of you that are teachers or were teachers, if you think back, one of the hardest things to learn is how to manage materials in a hands-on class classroom um, and worry about chaos happening, right? And so materials management is a skill to be learned. And what better place to learn that in a place where it's okay, it's a museum, it's okay to make a mess. There's no test at the end of the day. And if in the end, after two <coughs> hours, you 
don't get through your entire lesson, no one's going to say anything to you. It's okay. There's a lot of it's okays. And you're there to have fun, but you're also there to teach good content in sort of a low stakes environment. So that's put that on the list of solutions. That's a list of solutions. Uh, we agree. Um, <laughs> in fact, we just put in a, a very large uh, grant request to the National Science Foundation with the whole of science and, and new visions for public schools and Hunter and the international schools. Clearly, the distributed model of expertise and the clinical location is going to be um, a very, very rich one, and it's an exciting one. I think uh, the question of getting the best for at scale is always a challenge. And you're right, we, we have to bring in as many partners as we can and rethink these models because the traditional divide between doing your, you know, studying your John Dewey and Paolo Freire uh, for a year and a half and then being scattered gunned into a school for, you know, one semester and supervised by somebody who has no training, it, that has failed. Uh, one could have predicted it would fail, but we, we, we've got to kind of get out of that fast uh, as a model of teacher prep. What's interesting about what Pretty was saying, too, is that you could, could, you could create an ongoing relationship with those teachers so that it's not just the beginning of their teaching career where they have mm -hmm. that partnership with you guys, but as time goes on, they can maintain that partnership with you and not only learn new skills, but actually be able to network with other teachers who are part of your, your group. And that, again, gives teachers that a collaborative that a lot of them crave, mm -hmm. especially the first three years, because they do really feel mm -hmm. isolated the first three years. Yeah, let's, let's talk about the collaborative um, efforts here, because that's what the professional learning communities, um, the grant that we did in California was on, uh, was based on Wegner's work, and for W. Uh, Wegner, uh, and his work was on collaborative communities of practice, which is a professional learning community in all sorts of different disciplines and they have the same basic ideas and goals and it's basically the, everyone is different I think that's the most important thing to understand is that when you're talking about the relationship with the museum and with the colleges every single PLC that I've worked with is different you know they, they might have the same you get common language and common goals and common ideas but then they change and they adapt every time a person enters or exits a professional learning community it changes because now you have another scientist in or you have another a researcher in or you know how does it change a lot of the professional learning communities for schools are school based with just teachers working together to support each other and thinking of what what the converse with the conversation is and the work that I've been involved with how do we get more scientists and researchers involved in those schools. So it's not just school-based PLCs, but it's a, it's a professional learning community within the community, um, like we have right here at New York Academy of Science. How are we going to, to do that kind of thing? So um, what are some suggestions from the panel on working more, maybe some different ways, to bring some of these scientists um, and researchers into the classroom and work with teachers? I know Sam could talk about this for a long time. So. <laughs> Yes. Um, suggestions? Well, <clears throat> I mean, again, coming from a research background where I was in, you know, laboratories, it was always nice to know that when you got incoming graduate students or postdocs, that there was a trust that you could walk away at while they're at the bench and that nothing's going to explode <laughs> and that a paper that came out a year later, they're not going to be recalling and saying, actually, that data was falsified. Um, and what I mean by that is that I think the investment for a lot of people in research and scientists would be that these are the people you want to work with later in their academic career. And a lot of, I remember once being at a, a conference and being asked by a German scientist, why don't more American students with PhDs go into research or academia? Because most, a lot of uh, people, in the, a lot of Americans who get PhDs in science tend to actually not go into science. They tend to go into business. They tend to go into other uh, fields of like maybe writing for journals. They don't tend to become bench scientists. And I always made the comment that, you know, that the money's not good or they don't see the creativity there anymore. They feel burned out. And the one nice thing about teaching, and I always tell my students, is it's never a dull day with you guys. No matter how much I want it to be a dull day, it's not a dull day. <laughs> and when I think back to research sometimes, I'm like, I remember some dull days. Um, <laughs> So if you can kind of spin it in a way where you give them a sense of purpose and a sense that these are people you're going to be seeing come down a pipeline later, I think you'll get a lot more investment. And in New York, they've done a pretty good job with places like Columbia and Rockefeller, which actually do work with teachers 
uh, in programs over the summer to incorporate uh, research into their classrooms and to actually set up a partnership with teachers to come to the schools during the year to get more skills. How many people here are, are actual classroom teachers? If you could raise your hand just to get an idea of our audience. Great. And research scientists? Scientists? A few scientists here as well. Yeah, great. Administrators, <laughs> school administrators? All right, so it's a nice mixed crowd. Others, I'm sure there's others out there, but I'm glad to have you here. <laughs> Nonprofits uh, work, work in the informal institutions, the cultural institutions. Some of you from the culturals, I know quite a few of you. Great, great, okay. Um, other thoughts on getting more, developing these professional learning communities that really embrace the community with the scientists getting involved, and what can we do to support them getting into the classroom and making that a richer experience for our teachers? Suggestions? I can just say that um, the the MAT program, the, muse, the Masters in Arts of Teaching program just awarded to the Museum of Natural History, is built on um, the idea of scientists and educators working together to support um, the teacher candidate. So, I mean, the PIs, one is a scientist, one is an educator, and then the entire, entire team, if you look at the staffing of um, the faculty, it's half-half. And the courses are going to be taught that are going to start this um, June and go for 14 months or 12 months, Jim? 15 months, sorry. <laughs> are are co-taught by an educator and a scientist the whole time. And um, after the program um, leads to graduation, the induction piece um, is is uh, is well designed because it's inviting these teachers back regularly throughout the year in after school periods and weekend periods and it's working alongside the educators and scientists in that in that continued way both both face to face but also online um, and and um, and also I, m I neglected to mention that this summer those teachers the teacher candidates are going to spend their summer with me working with youth and um, teaching in the galleries and teaching in our summer programs and so on. But next summer, they're going to be in the scientist labs at the elbow of the scientists. So they're actually going to do work with scientists. Um, the, the, the professional learning community is so crucial here because what we know from our work, not just, um, I mean, mo much, very much so in the work in, at, the, at the museum at, I'm in now, but in general we know this, is that, that um, teachers create connections where they know they will get um, like-minded people will they, where they will get support and where they will get to feel like experts, right? So you, Michael, for example, are when you worked with the museum to help us develop that exhibits guide, that educator guide, you were bringing your expertise to us. And so it goes back to the professionalization issue. It's that teachers are not just always there for us to help them, but yeah, in the beginning, we support them, but then they come back and they support us. And so I think that's a big part of what we need to foster is how our teachers reposition to become leaders, repositioned to become experts and advisors for the, the institution that they have that relationship with, but also then for the newer cohorts of teachers. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on that? Great. Um, it's very interesting as the conversation continues. I mean, we're, what we're seeing is just what the role the academy is, is playing and can, can, can play and can continue to play of really trying to bring all of these resources together to support you, the teachers, in the classroom. And how do we do that and how do we assist you in, in going forward on this? It's a great one. What are some other issues that you're, there are other issues that you feel are important for teachers right now that are maybe uh, of great concerns teachers might have that you want to share that you'd like to come up with solutions and how we can, some solutions we might have? We talk about a lot um, at my school. I don't know if this is a conversation being had at other schools throughout the city or even the state, is that if we're in this profession and we've committed a certain amount of years to this profession, how does it translate into, and not necessarily running a school, but having kind of a voice in the school? There was a study done by, um, Ingersoll, I think is his name, at UPenn. And it showed that a lot of science teachers, um, especially minority science teachers, which is interesting, stayed at schools that they felt they had an impact in the entire school community. And they tended to leave schools where they felt that their voice was being kind of negated. 
And for me, I mean, as a teacher, I know that I'm at a school where fortunately, as, you know, as a teacher and other teachers, we do feel that. But I can say I've worked at other schools where I felt my voice was negated. And I can honestly say I left those schools because I'm actually at my second school now that I've worked at. And if that somehow that can be brought up for teachers, and I'm not suggesting that Bloomberg or any other politician's idea of there's a certain way uh, the hierarchy works that should be, you know, redistributed. But I am asking or saying as a teacher, and I think I'm not trying to speak for all teachers, that if you have these professionals, you have these people who are on the front lines and you're negating their voice, then are you really addressing what makes them want to be in this profession or are you really just telling them what they need to do and then if they don't do it, someone else will? I think that there's a, <clears throat> a kind of fundamental issue under, under this really important point that Michael's making, which is perhaps the only word I can think of is trust. Um, right now, policymakers and uh, administrators um, of school systems and um, many members of the so-called education reform movement, frankly, have a profound distrust uh, of the quality of teaching. That's just a fact. And when you distrust, uh, you tend to try to impose um, structures, disciplines, very Foucaultian vision, if you will. When you trust a profession, you, at the other end of the scale, you let the profession self-police. Right? So uh, you, you just imagine that the American Medical Association or the Board of, of Surgeons or whatever is capable of sort of doing it itself and you're not reading about some new accountability system for all doctors where the expectation is, you know, 4% of them will be fired uh, every year or something like that. Maybe there should be such a thing. I guess what I'm getting at is that we have to sort of turn this all around. Uh, we've got to sort of do a 180 degree flip here. Um, and it's, it's going to take a lot of different things to happen. Um, we would, we now speaking as policymakers, uh, and I have the privilege right now of serving on, on the Secretary's negotiated rulemaking, which is a silly phrase for something that's rather basic, which is the Fed's rules for ed schools across the country. What will they have to report? And of course, it's the same mantra, that is, ed schools will be responsible for the value added of their graduate students. That's what's likely. Um, and it's the same thing, right? You don't trust the ed schools. Um, and why don't you trust the ed schools? Because people like me years ago said the ed schools aren't very good. Uh, and I still argue that for many, many of the 1,400 ed schools. So to turn all of this around, we need, first of all, to break the cycle of um, weaker students going into teaching in too great a number, then being disrespected by their principals, the principals being distrusted by their superintendents, the superintendents being distrusted by State Departments of Education, the feds distrusting State Departments of Education for playing games with proficiency scores. It is distrust right the way through the whole system, and parents could be forgiven for distrusting it too. So if you start with the idea that you're going to encourage the finest of our students to go into teaching, then you create standards and curriculum possibilities and assessments that are world class. And you think about team teaching and hybrid courses and different ways of, of using cultural institutions and schools and break down the walls and think about 24-7 learning in, in new and exciting ways. And start to think of building a, a whole conception of education that's built on quality and trust all the way through the system. You will revolutionize the entire approach to teaching. The, the problem with this is it isn't going to happen in a day. And what we've done most recently in some ways goes in the opposite direction because it is out of deep nervousness about poor performance, not celebration of excellent performance. And so uh, Tayek, and I'll stop here, Tayek and Cuban, uh, two, two academics in Stanford, wrote a very short book, which I recommend to everyone, even though it's a little dated, called Tinkering Towards Utopia, where they look at the, the story of American education reform. And it's a pendulum swing, right? You, you have this reform, and just as it's being implemented, the opposite thing comes in. Any of you have played in a bathtub, right, with water going back and forth, um, and you make the wave crash into the other wave. Uh, maybe I'm 
giving you too much information. <laughs> but, uh, right. but, um, but that's the story of American education reform. And we risk doing that again. In other words, we've, we've set up this accountability system. And then on the other side is the sort of deep learning, constructivist, teamwork approach. And the two are just going to smash together in the middle and result in chaos again, if we're not very careful. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do to really rethink how to work together to break the cycle of mistrust. And the kind of work you've been describing and that we're proud, when I was commissioner, to have, to have helped with, um, the, the cultural institutions, the clinical work, the partnerships with scientists, that is a critical part of a large puzzle of trying to move away from the distrust model. May I pick up on this idea of the students entering teaching professions, right? So there's a couple of points I want to make, and um, one is that um, there was a study, and I can share that with you all. I forget the exact researcher's name at this very moment. But what they found is that um, you have A students in science, B students in science, and C students in science science, right? So the C students, let's just put them to the side because there's many reasons why they might be getting C off C's often because they don't have kind of um, some something's missing in order for them to excel, right? Whether it's external or, or intrinsic. Okay. Then you have the A students and what they found is that the A students are doing especially and now they particularly looked at minority students. A students were at, in that they were getting A's, were saying that, you know, I'm getting A's, I'm going into the sciences. Great. But when they get to the sciences, the science people are saying to them, I'm not letting you go because I need you in science, right? Because there's a dearth of minorities, of underrepresented people um, as, and women in the sciences. So they don't want to let them go to education. So. So the B people aren't getting into the, sci the science graduate programs, so they're the ones going into teaching. So now you have B-level students entering teaching. That's okay, right? B's good. <laughs> I'm a B student. But, but we, what I'm trying to bring up is that you want the top-notch students going into teaching, but the top-notch students are being taken to the sciences. And that's not a bad thing, but it's reality. The next best are going into teaching, and how do we need to support them? Because whatever made them get a B, how can we get them to become A-like, right? That's one point I want to make. Second, there are A students who maybe wouldn't want to go into science after a while, right? Like you. I don't know. Were you an A student? Okay. Uh, yeah, I was. I was. I was. I mean, I'm embarrassed to say, but yes, I was. Uh, that's not embarrassing. <laughs> That's oh. a good thing. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> but, but I think, you know, teaching is, shouldn't be a second thought, right? And it should be something that you develop an interest in, a motivation for, a passion for, hopefully earlier in your career. Now, you don't have to commit to it when you're in second grade, but you start thinking about it in your earlier career. So here's another solution. What can we be doing? And there are high schools for teaching, for example, and I don't know anything about how effective they are, but they are out there. What, and there are in New York City and across the nation these things called explainer programs. Um, what is an explainer? It's a person, it's a young person usually, who is working in a museum type setting having conversations about science um, with, with visitors. But they don't have to be museums. They can be conserv con, um, conservation places. They can be all kinds of informal science institutions um, that don't necessarily have four walls. And what, what we know, we have, we have um, long-term impact studies that demonstrate that when high school students are put into these roles of communicating science, not only do they get excited about science and pursue science, but a majority of them think about teaching as a career. And so what can we be doing to encourage teaching as a, as a mindset? Before, before the, but then say to them, go get your science degree, but with the intention that you're going to maybe mm -hmm. become a teacher. Great. Great. And now we'd like to open it up to the floor. And what we'd like to have you do is to really think on solutions. You know, what can we do? What are some... Pretty's come up with a couple of great solutions. Michael and David have added some really great thoughts and directions we should be taking. So if you could put your comments, think of it in that direction of what do you see as roles for the academy, 
um, people in this room? How do we get motivated? How do we work together to do the kinds of things that the panel has brought up today? It's our first uh, person. Hi, I'm, I'm Franklin Headley. I'm a principal and founder of Voice Charter School. It uh, focuses on music in Long Island City. Um, I was both a teaching fellow, and we've had uh, several students go through Teacher U at Hunter. Um, I actually came for advice, but I'll say <laughs> a little bit. Um, in our fourth year, we're really lucky that um, no teacher has left us yet that we've wanted to stay. But I'm worried because of that four to five years, people start leaving. And, I, and I'll say a little bit about what we've been doing, what we've been trying to do so that teachers stay. And I'd love to hear some other pieces of this. And, and I thought about what you said at the beginning. Um, we have deeply embedded professional learning communities that are very school-based, so that's we haven't really extended beyond. Teachers have a very large role in determining professional development and coaching. We have cabinets. We have lots of teacher-led committees. Um, and I don't remember the, th the third thing other than to say that I'm also like in love with the teachers and treat them as the talent. And I, and I think it comes very much from my own experience of how bad, although we had heat and toilet paper, um, <laughs> that's good. there wasn't a lot of love. Um, oh, and oh. I think that's also really important. So I think just hearing from anyone about at this sort of moment at this years four and five, what can we do differently to make sure they stay? I feel as if you haven't had any teacher turnover in an entire four years, you're probably doing a lot right already. <laughs> One thing I find, and I can't stress enough, and I'll try to maybe give you a concrete example of how to engender this, is uh, the idea of feeling uh, safe and valued. And it sounds like you're doing that already. I find when teachers feel like they're safe, and I don't mean just physically safe, but safe that I can say, you know, I don't think this professional development was you know, cater to what something I can really do. Can I try something else? And, you know, the administrators or the people in power say, you know, all right, go for it and let's see what happens. If you can kind of create that environment, I think you will find that teachers thrive and they'll love being there and they'll fall in love with you. It'll be a, a you know, symbiotic relationship. And also the idea that as they go along that they can grow and that you're not going to stand in the way of that. And I know testing is a big deal, and I know standards are a big deal, and charter schools, I think, are also falling now under the New York State regs, as far as, that, as far as that goes. But if you can somehow figure out a way where you can balance the testing and the idea of growth and you know, creativity, I think you'll create an environment where most people know that they're in a good place. And I think bringing in, like you're, from, from what you said, is bringing in more outside support in the various fields besides science to support the teachers in the school so they're part of a bigger community. But it does sound like you're doing all the great things. So good luck to you. It's great. May I add? Yes. You know, I, I don't have that experience that you have, but I'm just trying to picture myself in your shoes. And I, I, could, I, I do um, ex remember the experience of being in love with my staff. Um, I have that now and I had that before. And um, the question that I ask you is, do they love you? And probably yes, right, because they're do. there. So it, that's great. But it would be worth it to ask them, what, can, what, what do they want happening so that they could stay another four years, another year? I mean, maybe the answer lies within them and not, maybe we're not the best to give you this advice. They are. And um, the other thing I'll say is when, when it didn't work, as a, as a supervisor of staff, when I messed up was when I forgot to respect the knowledge that they brought at, um, historically to the department. So someone who's been there four years, um, they, they probably built the school with you. They, they've got history. And always like remembering that they have that and helping them to then take you to the next step. So um, I think you're probably doing all this, so you're not hearing anything new. But I, if, if, if anything, I, I hope that I'm just telling you, reinforcing what you might already be thinking. But I think that, that's what worked for me. And when I messed up, it was because I wasn't doing that. You know, the, in that MetLife survey I mentioned earlier, they also said that 77% of teachers did feel that they were supported and treated like professionals by the community they were working in. That despite all of the attack from the general world, that within the community they were teaching in, they did feel um, respected and appreciated. It's, it's sort of 
out beyond that where we need to really work to, to change the impression or the world for acceptance of teachers outside of their just teaching community. Uh, yes, Sam. Sam Silverstein, Columbia University. I've had the privilege of working with uh, Pretty uh, for a number of years and uh, I've had the privilege of running a program for science teachers for now 23 years where we bring science teachers from the New York City public schools into the university uh, for two consecutive summers to do research on the premise you can't teach something you've never done. There are no basketball coaches who've never played basketball, but there are 90% of science teachers who've never had to solve an honest-to-goodness science problem with the tools and concepts of science. Our results have been spectacular. There's only one other program that I know of that has spectacular results, and that's the one that Pam Mills runs at Hunter College. In fact, there are practically no outcome studies at all. Our results and PAMs are, to my knowledge, the only outcome studies that show that professional development can actually change what goes on in the classroom and get more kids, more kids, to pass the exams. So 15% uh, in our program, and I believe it's 20% for Pam's, uh, uh, for PAMS PERC program. Yeah. Uh, I want to make a couple more comments, and then I have several questions for you about money. There isn't a shortage of money. Actually, David, there is a billion dollars in New York State spent for professional development. I didn't say there was a shortage of money. You said your program was unsustainable. Yes. It's not unsustainable at a billion dollars. Five hundred and fifty million dollars are spent by New York City. The last time New York City accounted for this, which I believe was 2005, you put it in the budget, but if you add it up from all the little budgets, you come to the same number. Right, that's in-service, but we won't quibble. In-service teachers, yeah. there's $550 million that's spent for professional development. Mm -hmm. If that professional development were any good, the system wouldn't look the way it looks now. So I wonder whether you'd comment about mm -hmm. that sure. and how we can extract uh, some of those monies. And then I want to go on to scientists because I think I can speak uh, about that. Well, actually, I agree with you completely. There's no question that this country wastes billions on, on lousy professional development. The problem has been there's been no standard um, at all. Uh, and anyone who can put a little pinwheel on a wall uh, then goes to State Departments of Ed and says, you know, I'll do a PD program and uh, everyone goes and does these workshops and there's no outcome measure and there's no standard and we just waste our money. Uh, the hope is that with Common Core standards, with the partnerships that we're talking about this evening, um, with a more intelligent sense of balancing uh, practice with outcome measures that we begin finally to put some standards around these programs. Um, I do think that while we waste billions on the in-service bad professional development, we also waste billions on training far, far, far more people in ed schools than we'll ever go into teaching. So we, we actually agree, we have a massive misuse of funds both in pre-service and in-service. Um, and frankly, no other industrialized country I know does as badly. Um, I mean, it's quite astonishing uh, how badly we've done in, in both sectors, pre-service and in-service. Um, and so we, we have an enormous amount of work to do, and, and I think one of the great challenges, and you obviously speak to uh, as a person who's tried to overcome this, but unlike many countries, we've built an enormous um, silo between K-12 and university. Um, when the great German philosopher Hegel was offered his first professorship and he was a gymnasium <coughs> teacher, we have his letters. He was very indifferent as to whether university would be a step up or not. Um, you know, in this country, historically, uh, there's been an enormous prestige gap between the professoriate at the university and the K-12, and we have to break that down, among many other things. But I, I, I agree with you. So the second comment I'd like to make has to do with scientists. 
the idea that you're, you know, the reason people teach is because they really care about teaching. The reason scientists do science is because they really care about doing science. If you're going to take the scientists out of the university to teach, you're going to misuse the scientists. What we've done at Columbia, what Rockefeller does, uh, what Pretty does at the New York Hall, uh, at the Museum of Natural History, is bring the teacher to the scientist. Scientists understand completely the problem of science education. I have never called a scientist at R Columbia University. Ted Scoville has never called a member of the faculty at Rockefeller and had them say, take a teacher, what a dumb idea. Every person I call says, I may not be here this summer, but I'll help you find a placement for that teacher. We have, an, in New York State, we have more than 150 higher ed institutions. 224. Where there, what's the number? 224. 224, so he's done the math already. Uh, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, and those institutions have the capacity to take and create summer research programs of all kinds for science teachers. They're geographically dispersed throughout the state. What's required is the political will, as you said, to do this. I, I brought with me a bunch of reprints. Uh, you're welcome to them. I'll stop, but I, I, I think it's not that we don't have the resources. Thank you. It's not that we don't have the resources. It's, don't, it's not that we don't know what to do. We know very well what to do. And it takes 100 hours of professional development, at least, to change a teacher's practice in the classroom. Thank so you, we've sir. got to do it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Some really good, good insight. Um, over here, please. Hi. Good evening. Um, I have been teaching for 15 years. I taught 10 years in Charlotte, North Carolina, and this is 11 years in Charlotte, North Carolina, and this is my fourth year here. I started out in second grade, third grade, sixth grade, eighth grade. I now teach eighth grade literacy. I'm getting a master's in biology at Brooklyn College. Um, I want to propose the solution to all the teachers in the room. I'm finishing my thesis on the place of literacy in your science classrooms. Um, we have so many students that come to us that have so much trouble navigating the text, um, understanding how to read informational text, and it's been my experience through training teachers and working with Brooklyn College, which is where I'm at now, developing a curriculum for the graduate teachers before they graduate to actually have the literacy strategies in place to navigate the text in the classroom. Um, I think this is really important. You have teachers going into science, social studies, and math classrooms that have never had to teach reading skills or literacy, and then you have an entire group of students coming into those classrooms that can't navigate the text. So I'm really excited about this. I think it's something that needs to also be proposed for teacher retention because you get a group of students that really can't do anything with the text, and then you also have them coupled with a group of teachers who haven't been taught the skills to do that. And I'm looking at forward this year, I'm going to try and move into a high school biology classroom and use the literacy skills there to help with this issue and develop skills within the schools. Okay. Um, very quickly, David Coleman, the architect of the Common Core Standards, would be delighted to hear what you've just said because the whole premise of the Common Core Standards, for better or worse, is huge emphasis on nonfiction and close reading of texts. That's true. As an eighth grade ELA teacher um, for the past few years, I've been studying the Common Core, and the more that I look at the content areas, the more they're requiring the literacy, but they're not giving any development to the teachers to actually go in and teach those literacy skills. The writing of the essays, the writing of the lab reports, and my intent is to like try and get into some of these city schools and do some development with Great. teachers because everyone's getting lost in the process and it's something that's not being discussed the core standards are being you know handed down and the teachers aren't knowing what to do with the information great you know when i was the director of science with carmen farina who was the um deputy chancellor at that point she was 
wonderful at that the whole idea what you're talking about and we had trade books trade books had to be in every classroom k through 12 she was really insistent and pushed that so there are a lot of really good trade books um, lots of good literacy materials i believe in probably all of your schools from her work so i just want to give her that little plug she did great work with that um ferdinand uh, i'm fernand brunchwig uh and uh, i'm chairman of the science uh, education committee here at the academy uh, i've also founded or with a bunch of teachers, I founded a professional learning community uh, for physics teachers. And um, we've uh, been wor working uh, with them to have Saturday workshops, Saturday morning. Uh, they come and they pay $10 out of their pocket for each workshop, which most people hear that and they think it's unbelievable that people would come Saturday morning to, to pay. But um, they come very regularly. And um, the thing that made the big difference there was that it was something that was discipline specific, especially with the new small schools, most of the physics teachers. Now, I don't know to the extent it's true in the other sciences, but uh, they feel very isolated. They're the only physics teacher or indeed the only science teacher in their school. And the chance to be able to network with other teachers in their discipline uh, rather than to be in the kind of big fishbowl of all the disciplines or all the science disciplines has made a tremendous dip difference for them. So I'd like to hear from the panel about what extent you think that would uh, make a difference. I think it will make a huge difference. And it's funny you say that, you know, content-specific uh, professional developments really do make a, make, make a difference a lot of teachers because I remember professional development I did at Bronx Science probably eight years ago. It's one of the best things I ever done because it was it was geared towards chemistry teachers, and I was there with other chemistry teachers, and I remember saying to a bunch of big people there, like for the first time we're not talking about ramp up. I think at the time was what it was called <laughs> for literacy. I, they changed the name so many times, and we're not talking about bulletin boards. <laughs> I, well, that's mean, but it was true. We didn't we weren't talking about bulletin boards, and I remember being so um, I can't even think of the word so enthused to know that. I'm not only going to be learning about teaching chemistry, but I can also share uh, moments that maybe didn't work so well in my classroom with other people who are also teaching my subject or content. Because I find sometimes in schools, especially schools that are struggling with the test, that all the professional developments become about literacy and math. And not even really about math, it's mostly about literacy and making sure they pass the fourth grade, eighth grade, and English regents exams in high school. And as a science teacher, I mean, I'm not negating, because I think literacy is huge, actually, and I think your idea would be great for professional development. But I will say that as a science teacher, anytime you can get specific work in your content area, especially at small schools, it definitely creates this idea that you're not alone in a sense of community. And I don't think that, I hope I can keep harping on that, because it's a big deal. Yeah. And the idea that you're isolated is, is scary. Yeah, the community is very important. Great. Uh, we have just a few more minutes for questions, so the last two here would be great. Uh, my name is Giselle martin Kniep. I'm one of those uh, professional developers and writers of professional learning communities. And you ask for questions, but you also ask for solutions. Yes. So it's sort of a hard thing to do at once. But <laughs> both know. Michael and David started with a comment really about paradigm, both of you saying, you know, teaching, if, if only teachers will be uh, treated as professionals, life would be wonderful. Or if only we change the paradigm in universities and be like Finland and just train those that are that deserve to be trained, life would be wonderful. And maybe I'm, I'm obviously exaggerating to make a point, but I guess the question for me becomes: At what point do we take ownership of that paradigm? And and what's our piece of the pie? What's our piece of the pie as teachers to claim the professional uh, label and what's our piece of the pie in terms of universities to assert who we want to train and to what ends? That, I guess, not a solution but a, a question. I can start with the universities. When I uh, joined Boston University some years ago, uh, John Silber, who was then the Chancellor and also head of the Massachusetts State School Board, very controversial figure, but he in that, that first year halved the number of students allowed to be admitted into the ed school, actually cut it 50%, which cost the university over $40 million a year. If it hadn't been a private school, he would have been sacked by the Board of Trustees. Uh, the Secretary of Education has called schools of education cash cows, um, which is an unfortunate phrase perhaps, but it sort of gets to the point. I think the uh, there needs to be a, 
an equivalent of the Flexner <coughs> Report for ed schools. Uh, the Flexner Report, as many of you know, um, was a report about medical training, medical education, and the hospitals that were teaching future doctors. And within a decade after the Flexner Report came out, 500 medical schools had closed. Um, in my own tiny way in the 90s, in a much more important way, Art Levine and his work uh, tried to begin this process. Um, we have far too many weak schools of education, and those of us who are inside them have a moral responsibility uh, to do better, uh, to police ourselves, uh, to raise standards for admission, um, and to acknowledge that in too many cases, those folks who are preparing teachers um, simply are not master teachers themselves, um, have no experience of what it is to be in the classroom and teach well, um, are faculty who are in a sense part of an institution that wanted to be a College of Arts and Science but wasn't. And that's fine if you're at Harvard, Stanford, Vanderbilt, and you have hundreds of millions coming in for research. That's a different enterprise than creating effective teachers. So we have a lot of work to do, and the federal government and the state, um, and some of us in, in the ed schools, I think, do recognize this. We've, we've been very self-critical. And th there is a new group of deans across the country, um, from Arizona to Alverno uh, College, uh, from Johns Hopkins to Stanford, who have become, begun to be their own professional learning community and to say, let's start getting serious about clinical preparation, about partnerships, about at Hunter we videotape every student teacher multiple times. We have 10,000 clips that we use uh, as part of our, we have the largest video clip library in the world um, of pre-service teachers. And we're trying to get serious about our moral responsibility to create effective teachers, but boy, do we have a long way to go. So point well taken and the journey has started, but never quickly enough. Uh, my name is Sarah Church, and I'm a graduate student at NYU School of Public Service. I'm in the other category um, because I'm actually here because I'm conducting research into civil service system reform and <laughs> particularly into teacher yeah. layoff policy. So there's, there was a little bit of discussion at the beginning about the impact of pink slips um, on teacher retention, particularly, you know, we're seeing it as an impact on first and second year teachers. And um, I think it's really important to the discussion of layoffs to look at retention because retention is such a key issue. So I wonder if there are any um, recommendations from having looked a lot at retention that you might have um, for, for, for teacher layoff policy moving forward. <laughs> Not an easy area. No. I mean, that's, that's such a highly contentious area. Uh, I don't know where we can make, begin. Um, I mean, we have the new accountability rules that we're putting into effect. I don't know when they're going into effect. And we just recently had uh, teachers being, uh, the list being released of New York City teachers and their, their grade. Those are things you don't want to do um, as far as keep teachers around. But in terms of teacher layoffs, I mean, we, as, teacher, as a teacher I can tell you this, and I think most teachers would intone this, we want our colleagues to be as good as they should be. And we want our job to be respected, and we want to know that when we, in, we leave our, our, our students, that morally we did right by them. And when you're talking about layoffs, just measuring a teacher by a test alone is just horrible. Because it negates so many other things and so many investments that you have in a student that a test can't measure. And sometimes maybe an observation by a principal can't measure. So when you think about accountability and measuring that accountability, really look at the contribution to the community, the contribution to that student's life, and in all the ways that maybe sound like a little touchy-feely, but I think are just as important because if a student feels welcome to a classroom, even if their literacy levels are a little low, their science isn't where it should be, that's huge for a lot of inner city kids. So, thank you. Yeah, very quickly, I certainly, for the record, absolutely against the publication of those, those results. It was a first generation accountability system and it was never designed for that result. Um, and it should, should not have happened. Um, I think on the accountability that the state system, as you know, is, depending on how you count it, is either 20 or 40 points on student performance, 60 points on observation. Um, it's probably better than a number of states, uh, which are much more sort of single-minded about this. 
Uh, look, we, we, on the other side of the equation, um, just to the opposite of touchy-feely, we've got a major crisis in terms of performance. Um, when I was commissioner, we looked at the relationship between our graduation rates and college readiness. Graduation means you pass the regents, five of them at 65. Um, and the, grad, the college ready, I chose the lowest possible definition of that, which is ability to take a, a, a first level course in community college, right, not to be remediated. So the New York uh, graduation rate went from about 70%, give or take, on the region 65, to 24%. So 24% of, of those who make it to high school graduation in the city of New York uh, don't need remediation at a community college. We've got a major performance crisis. Um, and, uh, you know, I am absolutely for everything that we've said tonight, but uh, we are way under teaching our students, way under teaching. And there had better be lots of professional development and lots of important communities and deep respect for getting scientists and teachers to get everything that we've said is right. At the same time, we have to put a fire under parents. Their expectations are far too low. We have to put a fire under kids. Their work habits are far too low. I'm sorry to sound like a Victorian, but you know that the, the, the survey research is very clear. You go to Korea or, or Finland or anywhere in between, and 85% of parents want their kids in the top 15% of the class. The Japanese expectation of, of children's performance versus the performance and American ex views of their children versus their performance inverse, mirror inverse. So let's not, I mean, we all have a responsibility for a, for a system that is massively underperforming. Yes. I teach in a, in a school in the Bronx for 12 years, math and science. Um, I've had really, really good times and really hard times. Right now is a hard time. Um, the things that have kept me there have been um, feeling like I'm doing something important, um, being part of a team that that has like a has a purpose, and having a say and having some sort of autonomy. Um, that being said, right now I don't feel that way, um, uh, so I'm kind of trying to figure out what my next move is, um, but. One of the things I, I haven't heard talked about and are basically two things is since we're talking about recruitment is recruitment specifically in high need schools um, and how to get Good people question. to want to stay there when it's a, it's a difficult job. Um, maybe more difficult than teaching at a school where the needs aren't as great. Um, and so how do you equalize the playing field that way? Um, and it's not just money. It's not just paying people more to be there. Um, the other thing is, um, we've, I feel like we've only been talking about high school. Um, what about middle school? What about elementary school? Um, where are the science people there? Um, so two more pieces. Yeah, great points. Really good. I, I think that, you know, especially what you're talking about with the, the inner city schools, it's definitely a different, different problem. It's a different having worked in urban, suburban, all different sy systems, and in three different cities at this point, um, they do have a very different set of issues and problems, and it's definitely more challenging. It's also very rewarding when you get to the kids and when you can actually see the difference in them and, and the par parents get involved and you can feel the changes you're, you're making. But it is a very big challenge, um, which is why we set up that Urban Science Ed Leadership Institute to just try to get science leaders together talking about how as as inner city educators can we make a difference how, and it is very different and it could be an entirely another topic another session because it is a very big there's no question um, it's it's a difficult one and i think with the elementary piece you're talking about these same kinds of programs it's the same idea and it's it's bringing in the resources working with scientists for years trying to get them into schools they're very frustrated trying to get into schools because it's because of the way schools work you know, it's very hard to get to the teacher because they're teaching. They're with, with students. It's, they're not accessible. Um, so there are ways IBM and different companies have done very well with, with interfacing between the two. So we need to look at more of those as well. Yeah. There is a disparity between um, how a teacher's day works in this country and the, how it works in other countries. And we spend, I believe, 
approximately 80% of our time in the classroom, in front of students, and in other countries it's more like 60%. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of other professional time built into the day to do very, very important work. Um, but we don't feel like that's, we don't value that here, so. That's a, that's a great one. That definitely one that I'm sure that we've, we've heard about, thought about, and talking about the professional development money that, that we were talking about before with David and Sam brought up. Um, great way to, to change some of the, the funding that we do have in giving teachers more time. And that goes in terms of helping them feel more like a professional and really valuing their time. Um, something I remember reading about Finland was saying that retention is not even an issue because they p take the people that are going in, they train them, they expect to be teachers, they support them, they're revered in the community. It's not even something they talk about there. So, you know, it'd be great if that was our issue right here. So I, I think a couple of really big ideas that we had um, it's really changing, it, it's major changing of what the system is like, saying that is, although there are a lot of really good educational schools right now training teachers, uh, a lot of them that do great stuff don't really sort of advertise and support the work that they've been doing well. Um, they haven't done that. It's not they're not, they might, might be doing great PD, but they're not sharing the results of that because they hadn't had to share the outcomes at that point. So they need to do more of that as well. These institutions coming together with the nonprofits, uh, the nonprofit worlds with all of these great cultural institutions, institutions like the Academy of Science, really coming together with scientists and bringing them all together. Um, Preeti's idea about the high schools and getting the high school kids about becoming teachers. How do we encourage kids to, to start thinking about teaching and really having a, something desired to be a science teacher from when you're young? Um, just so many really good ideas and really great thoughts and really changing the way we're doing education pretty much across the board. The way money is spent, the way teachers are trained, the way the, we haven't talked about the way the school day is set up, but I think we've covered almost everything else of really making some sort of earth shattering changes. And hopefully these are, you know, kind of program like they have right now at the Museum of Natural History, um, with the work that we have at Hunter College, some of these other innovative programs. I know NYU does great work, a lot of really good work going on. So how do we sort of bring those very important um, ways of teaching together and really go forward. So I think this is a, a, a role for the academy. I think it's a great role for people here to say, let's get together and what are our next steps? Really, I want to thank the panel. They've been wonderful, really, really good. <laughs> Very nice. And so uh, uh, just on behalf of the Academy and, uh, and Demos, I would just like to thank the panel for an excellent uh, conversation that both looked at the big picture policy, but then also mm. the individual experience um, in the classroom and as a scientist, as a teacher, as a high school student, all the way along. Um, and I just want to say that we are um, in hopefully final draft forms of a, a white paper that have really formed a lot of the conversation here. So um, look for that in the coming weeks. And, um, and also for the e-briefing of this. Um, and I just, again, want to thank everybody for coming tonight and also thank the panel. So please go on.